Welcome to Building Projects 101, a continuing education program from SWLS. Um, if you haven't already, please edit your name so it reflects what you'd like to be called. And if you'd like, you can add your pronouns. My name is Shauna Kasegi, and if you're just watching this recording, I'm the Outreach and Continuing Education Consultant at the Southwest Wisconsin Library System. Today, I will be in the chat box. Um, so let me know if you have any technology questions or questions for John, and I'll do my best to help you out. Feel free to ask questions during the presentation. I'll be sure to get to you. This recording will be available on the SWLS YouTube channel after today. So if you have any questions also about accessing previous SWLS continuing education programs or materials, please let me know. And with that, we'll get started. John, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Are you able to take the screen? I got, yep. Oh, good, good. Yep, good. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm. John Thompson, I'm the director of the IFLIS library system, and I have been uh, assisting libraries within our system area for the last um, 14 years with various building projects. And prior to that, I was a library director in Prairie de Sac, where we um, did a variety of uh, space shuffling as well as uh, converting an old fire station into a library. So I've, I've been dabbling with library building projects for a long time. Um, so it's it's kind of kind of a pet project of mine just to, to help libraries out. It's a very daunting task. So we're gonna kind of start off with the basics today. Um, a lot of what I would typically um, talk about, generally each sub section of a building project could take an, an hour to three hours just on itself. So what we're really gonna look at today is taking um, a glance at the framework for a building project and, and move it through. Um, we have an hour and a half today. Um, feel free to add questions in the chat and we'll um, address them as we go. Um, so we don't want people to kind of get lost behind things. And, and so really with building projects, there isn't a magic bullet that will say, okay, this is the way to get a new building. This is a way to get an addition to a building. Um, every community is unique. Um, every municipal governing body is unique. Um, every project from start to finish is unique. Um, and in some cases, I hate, I hate to say this, we'll, we'll damper the conversation early. Um, some projects, span the entire lifetime of somebody being a library director. Um, sometimes they'll get done in two, three years. Um, some libraries are still after two decades, still trying to figure out how to solve a solution for a library. Um, one of the things that you wanna do while you're looking at that is really look at your assumptions that you're making for the, for the library. So. Again, if, if you're looking at a building project, and let's say you started this year and you're still waiting five years from now, you'll wanna go back and make sure whatever you've laid out for the community five years ago is still valid. Um, New Richmond, which is a, 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 it's on the cusp of being a, a Twin City suburb, for Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, their population has grown 20% in the last decade. Um, my guess is it's probably going at, growing at a rate of 5% a year now. Um, we did a space assessment for that library nine years ago. Everything that we projected for a 20-year a, a growth period nine years ago has already come to be. So they really need to go back and look at, okay, we got to go plan out for another 20 years. So 
that that that's part of this struggle that you as you know library professionals have is making sure that some number doesn't get stuck in somebody's head and say yeah we're we only need a 5000 square foot building well that was 10 years ago things have changed so we're going to kind of work through all of that um, give you some examples as we go through um, but again make sure if you have questions to let me know so we're going to kind of look at the um, concept of dreaming designing and building so we're going to really focus a lot on the dreaming side of this as well as some of the design piece the building piece is really kind of a, a separate um, process, but we'll, we'll touch upon it a little bit just to give you some awareness of what you need to think about. So the first step is really kind of looking at your current facility and then saying, okay, what do we need space for? So if, if we're looking at the building and it's like, yeah, it feels worn out, um, we feel like we don't have enough space, um, but stuff just doesn't feel good as a, a, a library space anymore. We then have to de decide um, when we look at this building, do we need a significant amount of space? Do we just need to add a new collection? Um, or do we need more seating? Um, and then, we have to really analyze, okay, are there short-term solutions that we can look at as well as long-term solutions? So, you know, if the floor, you know, carpet or, or vinyl floor is wore out, that's a, a, a relatively easy fix. Um, again, you're going to have to move all your shelving and all that stuff. So it is more complicated, but it's certainly a, a lot less um, of a headache than adding on to a building. Again, looking at your mechanical systems, um, looking at your library in terms of um, ADA compliance. You know, are your aisles wide enough? Um, are your shelves the the right areas? Um, do you have proper seating? Um, all of those kinds of things. You want to really look at it and say, okay, what does this building look like? And then, when you kind of look at your short term picture and then your long term picture, then you can decide how am I going to move forward with this? And there are different resources that you can, can use to help you assess that space. And there's some of it that's statistically based, but then it's, it's um, there's also that um, set of eyes on the building looking at it and say, okay, is what's wrong with this building? And a lot of times when, we live in our own space for a long time. We don't necessarily see everything because we, we've made do, we've gotten used to what it looks like, all of those kinds of things that we take for granted. It's kind of like yeah, change happens gradually when we work there for a long time. Whereas if somebody new comes in and says, oh, the, the, the deficiencies or the possible solutions may become a, a lot more apparent to somebody that's really looking at that um, building from a fresh perspective. So a couple of things, um, just kind of looking at some slides here, um, looking at some bookshelves, you know, yeah, we're short, we're, we're short collection space. So one of the things to look at is, okay, a, a really good library that's well-maintained, that has proper shelving, about three quarters of a shelf is actually at capacity. So in, in, in this picture up above, um, most of those shelves are already at capacity or over capacity. So what can you do? Well, if you need more room for materials, you may just need to go in there and say, I've got to get rid of stuff. It's, it's old. Um, and, and weeding is one of those things that we don't all like to do, but it's something that we need to do. Um, I, that's one of the first things that I do when I go in and help a library look at their space and say, okay, this collection's old. This collection, and the, one of the adages I use, if I remember buying this when I was a library director 17 years ago, it's too old to be in your collection. 
And that may sound, sound kind of silly that, that, you know, it's been, you know, 17 years. I, I literally walked into a library last week and there were books that I remember buying back in the eighties on those, on those shelves. So again, you want to have a fresh look to your facility. And so you, you really are, are looking at it from a, a customer service perspective. And, and I've, I've heard some library directors over the years say, well, we need to make it look packed. So we're not weeding so that people know we need space. The, the flip side of that comment is, well, if nobody can find anything new and vibrant in your library, why would they want to come to your library? Why would they want to support your library moving forward? It, so you've got to be able to balance those, those two things out. The, the other um, photo here is a picture of a library. Um, they need more space. Um, but the biggest issue, the, what you're seeing there by that green uh, radiator is actually the landing coming into the library. Um, it's a step up from the Main Street um, sidewalk. You walk into that landing and you have to go either upstairs to go to the adult collection or downstairs to the children's collection. Obviously, that building is not ADA accessible. Um, it, it was an old bank building. Um, it's historic in nature, the fact that it's been a, a downtown um, community for a long time. Um, never designed to be a library. Um, the fl floor loading for libraries, so the, the pounds per square foot, is 150 pounds per square foot. Very few buildings that have basements will meet that requirement. Most of them are somewhere between 100 and 125 if you're like in a bank building or some commercial settings. Office buildings are typically less than that. So you'll want to look at that and say, okay, this building wasn't designed to be a library. What, what's the structural nature of that building? Um, I'm not an engineer. Most library directors don't have an, engin in, an engineering degree. So you really want to bring in somebody from the outside and look at that building and say, okay, is this still structurally good? Um, this one in particular actually has a spot in the floor where you walk on it and the floor starts giving. Um, that was noted in a, an assessment that I happened to do for that library. And the first thing the paper says, oh, John Thompson from Mifla says the building's unsafe. What I said was you need to get an, an engineering assessment. So sometimes when people are reluctant to change, those conversations start coming out and you have to be aware that you wanna look at experts to, to work on, on that piece. Um, the picture up at the top, again, th this library um, has some good space to it in terms of the ceilings are really high, um, but there's a, a mismatch of stuff in there. Some of the shelving is um, green, some of it's brown, um, some of the, sh the seating is older, um, there's not necessarily a cohesive feel to it. Um, so again, this might be a, a situation where the library director changes some of the furniture around and updates it and the space may be fine for another five to 10 years. But if you, if you're really cramped, you don't have that opportunity to do that. So those are kinds of the kind of the, the visual sides of it, the, um, resources for data would be um, looking at the public library space needs outline um, that was created for Wisconsin. It's getting a little old now. I think it's 2009 when, when the last update was done. Um, ironically, um, many of the other statistical documents pattern themselves after that space um, planning guide. So if you, if you were to go to the Connecticut site, there is a, a similar guide and it references back that the, the basis for this document was the one created in Wisconsin. There are some other 
print resources that are out there. Um, there's a, a space planning guide that was um, commissioned by Massachusetts um, with an architectural firm. It kind of gives you some ideas for smaller libraries all the way up to large libraries. Um, it lives virtually, but it, you know it's kind of that print-based piece. Um, there's an ALA publication called the Practical Handbook of Library Architecture. Um, that book is literally a thousand pages long. It's not something that you're going to read in one sitting. It's not something you're probably ever going to read from cover to cover. Um, I, I, to be honest, haven't read it cover to cover, but what I've, I've used it for is a, a resource. So if I'm looking for a specific instance, there, there's, um, you know, like ceiling heights, I'll go flip through that chapter and, and kind of re read that. The interesting part about that particular book is it does it from a, um, a very down to earth kind of like without with actually without a lot of BS in there. Some books you just have, it's kind of a glossy picture of stuff. They kind of basically come out and say, yeah, if you you're moving in a library that's got eight feet, feet foot ceilings, that's stupid. I mean, so they're very blunt about some of their assessments of bad things that libraries should should not be doing or should be doing. So it's, it's a good resource. There's actually a, a, a subset of that book that was published uh, a little bit ago that's um, probably a, a tenth of what that the other one is. And um, so again, you can find that out at ALA. Um, so that's kind of um, that the, the pieces for the assessment. I don't know if there are any questions yet, Shauna. Hi, John, there's no questions yet. All right. So kind of the, the, next, the next piece of, of what you wanna do with your project is if you've really made that determination of, yeah, we need more space, how are, how are we gonna get there? Um, one of the things that you'll want to, to look at is creating a building committee. So this is a, a group of individuals from your community that will help sell that project. It will also help guide some of the big picture principles of the project. Um, it's very difficult for a library director to be the champion of a building project because if, if you're the only voice that's out there trying to sell that project, it, it, it can get to the point where they're just saying, well, this is John's pipe dream. We're not buying into it. The community doesn't need it. We don't see any support. So if you've put that building committee together where you've got staff, you've got board members, you've got a municipal board member on there, you, you, you can also add, um, you know, maybe the local banker, the prominent business owner, some, some folks that have some influence in the community that are library supporters. You know, the committee would be created most likely by the library board. Um, it will be subject to open meeting law, so you, you'll have to be mindful of that for Wisconsin um, and post, post it like all your other meetings. The unique piece um, in Wisconsin is that library boards have a lot of broad duties and authority. The one where we, as library boards, have to ask permission is to construct a new building. So that authority has to be delegated from the municipal board to the library board if you're going to manage that project yourself. If the municipality chooses to build a new building and they don't want library board involvement, they can do that. So basically they could create a building and say, hey, here's your new library. It can be smaller than what you have now. It could be designed not to be as functional as you would like it. Um, and, and, and most of the choices are already made for you and you basically move in. And, and while that sounds like, why would they do that? I've actually 
I'm, a, I'm living one of those projects right now where the city decided that they wanted to buy a old bank building that the bank was moving out of for, for a new city center for city hall, the police department and the library. They, the library was already in a 24,000 square foot two level facility. The, the, the lower level um, was storage and space for the friends, as well as actually sharing out the space to the local historical society. Um, Hi, John. It, yeah. We do have a question. Okay. Someone's asking, does this apply to buildings and land bequests? There's actually um, another piece of statute that if there's a, a gift of a library, then the library board has um, authority over the, the location of that library. So it, it, would, it would have to be somebody saying, yeah, I'm giving you X number of dollars for a, for a public library. And basically that's the cost of the library. Um, so yeah, there, there is that provision in there. That doesn't happen very often in Wisconsin. Thank you, John. Yep. Um, so the, the, the library was, was, was in that space and now they're moving into a building that's being shared by city hall, a municipal court, the police department and the library. And that building is 22,000 square feet. So if you do the math, the library is actually moving into a shared location that's smaller than their entire building right now. Um, the city is managing the project. Um, the library board hasn't been invited to updates. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's been an interesting challenge there. Um, so you really want to make sure that you get some sort of approval from your municipality, um, moving forward. Um, kind of look at what your dream is, um, wh where, where do you envision the library being today and 20 years into the future? What, what you really wanna look at is how, did, how do we dream this reality? We've been used to making do in a space that we've had for 15 years or 20 years, or you know, in some cases, 40 years. Um, we've made changes, but we've just made do. Um, Library directors, library staff have always kind of, yeah, we'll make do with what we have kind of thing. Um, so that's one of the things to, to kind of step back and avoid in, in a building project is it's better than what we have now. Well, chances are this is going to be your one shot to get this done. Um, it's very rare that a library director will have two building projects in their lifetime um, at the same facility. So you you want to make sure that you can have the building that you think you need for today and into the future so that you can really make sure that it's what, what you need. Um, you may have to compromise towards the end um, because of budget, but you don't want to compromise at the beginning because if you compromise first and then have to recompromise, you're you're probably not going to be where you really want to be. So how do we figure out what we want in our new library? We, we ask the staff. Uh, we we go out and ask the community. We evaluate what evaluate what spaces are missing in our community. So if if there's no community center, no meeting spaces for um, various clubs in the community, that's something that you want to look look at. Um, you want to look at function versus style. So sometimes when you wander into a library, it looks like it's it's an awesome architectural wonder. 
but it doesn't function as a library space. Um, so you, you kind of want to, you want some style in that building, but you want to make sure the function is there. What do you need for, for patron spaces? What, what's really missing? Are you um, missing seating, um, computer space, um, quiet study areas, uh, your big program meeting spaces? You know, what are the staff areas that are missing? You, you know, is the director's office shoehorned in a corner? Um, staff storage is scattered all over the building. Um, are, are there things that you, you know, break room, restrooms, all of those kinds of things that you don't as a staff have, um, there, um, you know, might be considered amenities for the staff, but you really want to make sure, again, if you have a good staff space, it will help retain your staff moving forward. And then the other piece is, is looking at your community and saying, are there spaces that others need that we can piggyback on. So, you know, if your municipal building, um, Village Hall, City Hall is lacking space, if the police department's lacking space, if the uh, community senior center is, is non-existent or, or deficient, are there ways that the library can piggyback and make a shared use building that makes a, a really a cost-effective solution for your community? So we obviously do lots of library programming. Many of our programs for story time may only have 10 kids in there. When we get to summer reading programs, we may end up with a program that's got 50, 100, 200 people in there. It's great if we have a chunk of land outside that we can do those programs outside, but you know this is Wisconsin, so we're kind of weather dependent for most of the year. Well, to be honest, we don't probably need a hundred person meeting room every day. We, we won't use it that often. Those spaces are very expensive. Um, village board, they, they, they have a meeting, you know, there's seven board members and maybe five people from the community. They don't need a huge meeting room. They do when it's election time and they want to funnel folks through an election, they need the space. Um, senior meal center or a community space for people to gather to, to have a, a noon meal. Again, that space can sit empty for most of the day. If you put a com commercial kitchen in there, um, you have the ability to have a third use within that space. That also helps build community support. In some cases, it doesn't make sense to share a municipal building. The, the larger the community, the less sense that it makes, depending on the land that you have available. So what you don't want to do is try to put all those shared uses into a space on a, on a piece of land that it doesn't fit. You want to also make sure you have a, a parking lot. And that's a very important piece. So um, hey John. what, yeah. Do you mind if I, we have a question from your sure. previous slide? Yep. Um, someone asks, but how does that fit the statute 4358 that the library board shall have exclusive control of all monies collected? Doesn't that give them total control? Or is that only if the municipality gives approval then going forward and library board has exclusive control? Right. So for a building project, um, you first have to get permission from the municipality to move forward with a building project. If you if the library board doesn't get that permission, then the municipality can say, yeah, we're gonna manage the project and, and move it forward. The trick then, and this gets kind of into the few slides down, but is how, how that project is funded. So the donations to the library um, for that project do fall under exclusive control of the library. So if you're working on a project and the city says, well, you need to raise a million dollars, that million dollars does become under the exclusive control of the library board. However, in some cases, the municipality will say, well, we're not gonna start the project until we have those, those funds in hand. So then you're kind of this, roadblock 
um, okay, well, we want exclusive control. And the city says, well, we're not going to move forward until we have the money. The library board then has to make a conscious decision. Yes, we're moving those dollars over to the village or the city for the building project. If they're unspent, those donation funds should come back to the library board. Um, that's the way that would be interpreted. Um, this is one of those projects that you're going to have to to work in that political environment and make sure everybody's comfortable moving forward. Um, You're asking so it, if the city gives the go ahead, then the board has control. Right. That's they'll they'll have control. They they should have um, the ability to design the library the way it they want it designed and how and control the cost. But again, if, if you're, if you're relying on some municipal support for the project, so they're going to borrow, a, you know, a million dollars or $2 million, they're going to want to look at what the design looks like and, and, and be informed of what's going on there. They shouldn't say, well, no, I don't think the circulation desk should go there. I think it should go there that level of um, detail is not within their purview, but you you really want to be able to focus on big picture. This is the stuff that this building is going to do for the community and, and communicate that to the municipality. Um, having said that, you still have to fit within your local zoning ordinances and all the compliance pieces. So the municipality may sign off on the site plan. They may look at the building and say, okay, this is too close to the property line. You need to set it back some. They're still going to have some input in this conversation. So you, you really wanna to work together with them. You just, your, your project will not be successful if you don't have your municipality supporting you. Thanks, John. Yep. So, that dream that you have, how do you, how how does that dream become a reality in terms of figuring out what you really like and don't like? So, the the way I find um, most helpful for me is to actually go look at libraries. Um, yeah, obviously with the COVID environment, it's a little um, more restrictive in terms of just popping in a vehicle and driving places. Some you know, there's different requirements at, at different libraries, but um, what you want to do is, is look at all libraries. So even if you're looking at building a small library, which quite frankly, most of the libraries in Wisconsin are small libraries. Um, you, you want to look at all types of different sizes of libraries because you're not really looking at the exterior of the building. You're looking at the components within the building. So you're looking at the furniture. Oh, yeah, I like this style of furniture. I don't like that style of furniture. I like the layout of this building. I don't like the colors of this building. I don't like that they used concrete floors. Um, I don't like the fact that they put suspended ceiling in. I'd rather have it look industrial. Um, those are all the likes and feels. Um, ask staff what they would change about the building um, when they've moved in. Um, kind of create your um, virtual scrapbook. So if you if you take pictures, make notes about what you like in those pictures or don't like, so that you have that frame of reference moving forward. Um, those tours are great to take with the building committee. They're great to take with the friends of the library. They're great to take with your municipal board members. Um, in an ideal world, you'd hop on a, a, a bus, you'd all ride around together and look at the buildings together. Um, note that you will have to make, you'll have to notice that as a public meeting that you're going around touring libraries, but you're not making decisions as a group. You're just out there doing research. Um, that way you can kind of see different styles, different buildings, all in a day or two and really hone in on what you really like. Obviously you can do some virtual visits, um, you know, Pinterest, um, just going and checking out library websites, Facebook pages. You can get a sense of what libraries 
look like, you don't necessarily get the feel of what they are. And that um, is just as important. So yeah, I, I like this color or I don't like this color, but if you see it in the context of the entire building, it may make more sense than that snippet of a snapshot that you saw um, in a certain spot. So the next few slides are kind of just walking through some of the different libraries um, that are newer, just to give you a sense of what some of them look like. So walking into Colby, uh, again, a smaller community, this is a standalone library. Um, it's got a metal roof on it. Uh, it's designed by an, uh, an architect that works for an engineering firm. Um, so they're going to be a, a lot more functional, less decorative. Um, so, you know, you, you walk into the building, you get a sense, you, you know, walking in on uh, tile floor. Um, and then you kind of get this, yeah, we're, we're doing wood in here. We're, we're, we're looking at this from a um, more of a traditional kind of feel to it. Um, and then me as the critiquer in this kind of thing is noticing that there's beach balls sitting on top of the shelves. So in some respects, that space looks a little cluttered as you wander in, even though it's got a huge wide aisle, those beach balls seem a little bit out of place. Um, this is, this is a library in Somerset. Um, it was actually an addition to, um, a 1980s building. The addition was 9,000 square feet onto a 3,000 square foot building. Um, there's, there's pops of color in here, but most of the walls are a neutral color. Um, they have a polished concrete floor. And so it's, it's got more of a, an industrial look to the floor. Um, but other pieces of it are a little bit more um, welcoming in, in, in the sense of a traditional look and feel. So you've got uh, that yellow um, wall piece there is actually in the teen area. There's a fireplace that's two-sided. On the flip side of that, you can kind of see some windows there. They created a quiet reading room. So on the other side, it's fireplace and more traditional lounge seating for adults to kind of sit and read their magazines or newspapers. Um, there's also a purple wall that stands out um, that they actually have for an art wall. So all the um, student art or artist exhibit that fits on that felt um, backboard. Um, but again, it's, it's a pop of color within a pretty gray neutral um, building. The, the ceiling tiles in there are actually brown. Um, it's kind of a wood grain feel to uh, ceiling tiles that were custom printed. Um, so they're different than the white standard tiles that um, you would normally see. Hi, John. Yeah. <laughs> we have a we have some folks talking about how library tours have been really useful for them in making decisions for sure. And we also have a question. Do you sort of separate areas into low cost, high use and high cost, low use or even low, low and high, high? In term, in what terms, in terms of the quality of materials or? Good question. Yeah, Kent, if you want to clarify in the chat, feel free. Again, it says, do you sort of separate areas into low cost, high use, or high cost, low use? And Kent says, in terms of a return on investment. Yeah, so when, when we're looking at library spaces, in terms of the overall building construction, you wanna make sure that you have the highest quality you can afford. When you get into the furnishings of the library, again, you wanna look at high quality, durable stuff um, that's gonna last 15, 20 years because chances are you're not going to replace that. So this gets into the design philosophy. So um, if you wanna go in, to the adult area, chances are 
you're going to use a, a more conservative color pattern um, and colors that are going to last for a long time. Whereas in the teen area and in some respects, the kids area, you may want to do more trendy colors. Um, and in that case, you may be okay spending a little less on furniture knowing that in um, three years you're, or five years or 10 years, you're gonna change out the colors um, and they'll be wore out by then. So you can, it's easier to change the colors then. On the flip side, if you buy a high quality piece of furniture, you can always reupholster it. So that the frame, the guts of that chair are still good. Um, you're just gonna put a new skin on it. So you kind of want to look at it from a, what does my budget allow me to do? Again, looking at it as this might be the only time we get to do this in the next 20 years. Um, so you kind of really want to balance it out, but you know, teen area, you're going to get lots of use and abuse, even if it's not a heavy traffic area, you know, like you may only have 20 teens in there, you know, on average, for a week or whatever, they're, they're going to tend to move the furniture, tend to sit in it like teenagers do. Um, so it's going to get more wear and tear that way. Whereas an adult chair, they're probably going to be a little bit more respectful of the chair. Um, same with the kids, you know, they're going to climb on furniture. They're going to do all the, the things that kids normally do. So you, you kind of want to balance that all out. The unique part of, of Somerset was the director at the time was an, a very crafty person. Um, so some of the stuff they actually repurposed from other places. So the, the chairs that have the green backing on them, um, th those were actually something they got from a hospital that was changing out their furniture. They just basically reupholstered them a little bit and did some um, cosmetic upgrades to it. Um, so in this case, it's kind of a mix a mix and, and match kind of situation. We have another question. Yeah. Do you have to notice, give notice um, for building advisory committees if you don't have a quorum of officials on it? So the, 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 the building advisory committee, so if, if your building committee was appointed by the library board or a municipal board, they are a sub group of your municipal board board so they have or library board so they have to notice those meetings thanks john so this is one key um a, a much larger library project um and they have a lot of different spaces in there so um again looking at the lighting and saying okay yep i i like that style of lighting i don't like that style of lighting um, there's, there's different types of fixtures in different areas. So this one particular sp space is kind of built around the fireplace. Um, so they have uh, more pendant lighting, drop down lighting, whereas the main part of the library has the um, lighting within the ceiling. Um, the lower area, again, it's, it's um, metal shelving um, with uh, wood grain laminate end panels. There are several different types of book displays that were built into the end panels. If you look at them, you'll notice they're a, a thicker end panel than a, a traditional one. Some of the display shelves are actually built in, so they're, they rest within that panel. Um, one advantage of, of that is that a person with um, vision impairments, if they're using a cane, they're not, they, they sweep to see what's in their way. Well, some of the book displays, if they're sticking out, they may not um, catch them in a cane sweep, but they can run into them while they're walking down, down an aisle. So this kind of eliminates that um, situation. Um, there, there's also different um, ways that people want to be creative in displaying the material. So that gives an, uh, a good way of doing that. If you look at the bottom of the shelves, um, it might be a little hard in this picture, but they're actually at a, a slight tilt. So one of the things that gets problematic is 
you know, that bottom shelf, it's hard for people to see. Well, this slants it up a little bit, so it's a little easier to, to read the spines. Um, they also have integrated uh, a display shelf at the top there, kind of like you would use for magazines. And that's something that they use to, to display their books out. So it, it, it's the same shelving, different types of um, shelves within the unit just to, to give it a different look and feel. Um, so this example is in Sauk City. This happens to be a renovation of an hist a historic building within Sauk City. So it used to be a um, monument um, granite manufacturer. So they would bring in giant chunks of granite on rail cars so that they could make the, the monuments. So if you, if you look very closely at the picture at the top, you'll notice that the um, crane system that they use to lift the granite off the rail cars is still in the building. Um, it's that brown circular thing there. That literally is the, the um, part of the crane system that they used. The lighting in there is more of a period style decorative lighting for an industrial type setting. Um, this project, they had to um, really get the approval of the historical society in the in terms of preservation. So what look and feel they could have in the building in some ways was dictated because it was a historic building. So you'll, you'll look at it, it's kind of got that late century industrial look to it that fits the period of the time for the building. Uh, the unique thing is that the library wanted to have a fireplace in their building, which was not period, um, was not approved by the state, um, what they did do is um, they added a um, old fashioned, very decorative wood stove in there that they put in the corner. So they got the look and feel of, of, of warmth from a fireplace, but it was in a, a form that fit the period of time. So it might be really cool design. Some people might really love it and others may not, but it's got a, a very distinctive industrial look to it. Um, you, you can see the, the woodwork that's in there. Some of that was existing from the structure, so they worked around that building. Um, the, the next picture is a, a more modern, um, newer building. Again, it has a huge glass set of windows kind of looking out into a courtyard. Um, seating around that again it's a mix of seating uh lounge seating and, and tables and chairs uh, a much more traditional look and feel to the shelving um the end panels are have more of a wood look um and again it's more of a decorative kind of um look and feel to them to fit the period of you know can more of a historical kind of look to to the building so the, the lower room is a is a local history room slash uh, meeting room and it has a fireplace in there the opposite side goes out into a, a reading lounge but this this particular room um was the pet project of the library board president so um the history of the the region is contained in that room there are locking cabinets there's locking display cases there's lots of artifacts that you would typically associate with a historical society. They don't have one in this community. Um, so this really is functioning as the area's history area. The, the glass in that space was um, museum quality in terms of being ref, um, reducing the amount of daylight that would impact the collection inside that particular space. So too much sunlight would you know, fade things. They actually looked at a, a museum and saying, okay, what kind of glass do you use for your big windows? It's a, it's a really cool space. However, that space, they had to make a sacrifice with the children's area and the children's area probably fits within that meeting room as well. So it's not, or it's not a huge space for children. So 
again, you kind of want to look at buildings for pieces and not necessarily the whole whole building in, in particular. Um, Abbotsford, um, my first uh, look at this building, it looks like a depot for a train. And in fact, if you were to go on the other side of the building, the train tracks run right by that library. So yes, it was patterned to look like a train depot that may have been in Abbotsford at some point in its history. This happens to be a shared um, municipal building. So the, the far wing is um, the village hall, uh, some of the village meeting spaces. Um, the main door there that you see goes into a shared lobby. You, you veer off to the right to go to the village functions. You go to the left to go into the library. Um, you, you'll look at the, the signage in that lower picture. All of their signage is big and they have all of that type of signs throughout the entire library. So some people will like, oh yeah, I can see where I'm going. And others may say, this is way over the top. It's too big for what we're looking at. Again, it's kind of that uh, traditional look and feel of, of a library wood, um, standard lighting that's dropped down, um, not, nothing too um, unique about the lighting in there. But, you know, some people love that kind, others don't. Um, so those are kind of the um, big pictures of just a sampling of libraries to kind of look at, um, to, to think about what you're doing with that space. Um, then what you want to do is, is put all those thoughts down into a cohesive document. And that's called a, a building program statement. So really what this is going to do is help the committee and the library narrow down what they want in their library because all of us have different ideas and thoughts. Um, I may like certain things and others will like something else, but you want to have a clear direction for the library moving forward. You want to be able to put that document together. So when you're working with an architect, they understand where you're coming from and, and really focusing on meeting your needs that you've outlined in that document. Um, many people will say you, you want to have a library professional that has done building projects help you with that um, building program statement. Some architectural firms will develop one for you. Um, but again, you want to, if, if that's the route you go, you want to make sure that it really truly captures your intent and not the desires of an architect. The architect works for you. You want to make sure their, your, your vision is communicated and they design your vision. So you want to kind of put together a, a, a introduction and overview of the library, history of the library, maybe some context if you've got a site already picked out, a contextual history there. So if it's, you know, if you're putting it downtown and you've got a historic downtown, you want um, the look and feel to, to match downtown. Or if you're in a, in a case where downtown is run down a little bit and it needs to be upgraded, the library may be that focal point to redevelop your downtown. So you want that to, that signature building to be communicated to your community. Then you, then you wanna focus on individual spaces. So director's office, well, you want a desk, you want some guest chairs, you want some file cabinets, you want some bookcases, you want a window, you want um, a, win a window to into the library and a window looking out so that you can see daylight. That's your desired director's office. You want that office located next to or adjacent to the circulation desk. That's all the kinds of stuff that you would put into that office area. Um, you know, carpet on the floor, all the kinds of things that you really want to have in that space. 
Um, and you, you know, you go into the children's area. You want it to be adjacent to the teen area. You want it to be um, near the restrooms. You want um, it to be bright and bold. You want the um, carpet or you know a luxury vinyl tile. So you know the the vinyl planking. You, maybe you want that in part of the an activity area for the for the kids. You want it to um, have ways to um, lessen the the impact of sound coming from that area into the rest of the library. You don't you don't want to wall it off, but you want to make it acoustically friendly. Um, story time space. Are you going to have a dedicated story time space? Is it going to be near the kids area? Or are you going to wander all the way through the entire library with um, kids through the quiet adult area to get to your story time space? Um, do you want to have a maker space? What do you want in your meeting room? Um, you want um, high tech uh, meeting room. Uh, you want it to be able to to be divided in half. You want to have a kitchenette in there. You want to have um, vinyl floor in there. Um, you want it to be um, accessible after hours. So you want the restrooms located nearby. You want to be able to shut it off from the rest of the library so people can use it. Um, you know, when the library is not open. Um, what do you want for a workspace? Um, obviously, you probably want it near the um, circulation desk, but it, you know, the larger the library, the less adjacencies you might have to have with that. Um, what kind of cabinets do you want? You know, what kind of shelves do you want in there? Do you want an island to work at, countertops? All of those kinds of things play into creating that document what kinds of furniture you're gonna have in there. So the workroom, you want file cabinets, storage cabinets, um, three computers, um, a disc cleaning machine, a sink, um, all of those kinds of ideas should go in there. The, the tricky one now is how big those spaces should be. Um, and that's where, when you've looked at those tours, you can kind of say, okay, this makes sense to me. This is the right size. Um, you don't want to go too big. You don't want to go too small. But we're used to shoehorning things in the spaces, so we 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 have to allow ourselves to really focus on what we want. Um, so you know, sometimes it helps to, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I want a hundred square feet. Well, hundred square feet is a ten by ten space. Two hundred square feet. No, can I? You know, if I have enough room, and this might be difficult, but you maybe could do it outside is kind of tape off what those sizes of spaces look like and say, okay, ah, yeah, that's 200 square feet. Yep, I can see the desks there. I can see people there. I can, yeah, this works. That's one way of, of kind of building that together. And again, then looking at that relationship between areas, you want to make sure that um, you're having the spaces close enough to that. So, you know, if you're in a small library and the director needs to work the desk, your office shouldn't be a, a, across the building where you can't see the circulation desk. Um, architects will look at it and say, well, yeah, you need a quiet space away from everybody else for your office. Well, yes, but if, if you're expected to be at the desk 75% of the time, you, you need to be able to get to your office, do some work, and then be back out if it gets busy. So you really kind of want to look at those very closely and make sure that that's clearly defined. When that's all done, you then use this document to look at the drawings from the architect and say, yep, they hit everything that we were talking about, and it makes sense to us now. We have the spaces where we want them. We have it. The, you know what it looks like. Um, now we we we've kind of have that piece there. Um, we then the the next big thing is how are we going to pay for this? You know we have this dream. Um, a library project typically um, gets funded in three different ways. It's all done by donations. The minute or the municipality pays for it all on their own. 
um, or it's a combination of, of those two things. Um, every project is going to be unique. There isn't a magic solution to that. Um, for example, the project in Somerset, um, the municipality said, we're not going to fund any of it. It's all on you. They did take out a loan um, to help bridge um, the gap in fundraising, but the library has to pay off that um, loan with their own money. Um, others will will say, "Well, we're going to cost share it. We'll we'll do a, a, you know five hundred thousand dollars if you raise the remainder of the funds." Um, you you really to do to do a strictly donation based project is very difficult um, because a lot of folks that provide grants for projects are looking at the municipal support and is there municipal support for that project so it's always best to have kind of that mix in there um, and then there's the um, other side of my brain that says, well, the fire department's not out raising money to build their fire station. The police department's not raising their money for their, their project. The village hall isn't raising money to build their village hall. Libraries are kind of in this unique role where we're, we're kind of, you know, like if there's a park project or a pool project or, or certain things, they're kind of put together in, in, in that area where fundraising is more of an expectation. Um, so going into this project, don't assume the municipality is going to pay for it all. Um, having said that, the, this project is most likely going to be a million, two million, three million, five million dollars. It's not going to be a cheap project. So you, you have to really focus on that. So even if you were to say, okay, I've got this great building downtown and we're going to repurpose it as a library. Changing the use of that building requires it be to brought up to current building code. So there's a huge expense there just in that. Um, so renovation generally is cheaper, but not always. You, 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 you can get in the project where it's much more expensive. But on the other hand, there may be reasons why you want to save a building or why you want to do something that makes that project make sense to you. So th this slide kind of gives you an idea of, of some of uh, the avenues for that. So uh, obviously borrowing from the municipality. Um, impact fees are fees that municipalities can charge to fund future infrastructure projects based on development within the community. So they will assess those to a developer. So let's say they're building a new subdivision, um, they would assess impact fees and it would have to be used for infrastructure projects moving forward. Those have to be passed by the municipality. They have to be done after there's an assessment of the current conditions of the infrastructure, what the infrastructure should be today and not what the infrastructure, and then the, the impact fees would pay for future. So an example would be, let's say you're in a building of 2000 square feet and you know it's cramped and it's way too small. What they're gonna look at in part of this set, signing those impact fees is, well, your library really should be in a building of 7,000 square feet today. Impact fees will not pay for your library to go from 2,000 to 7,000 square feet. It'll pay to go from 7,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. So it's only paying for that new growth beyond where you should have been at. Um, impact fees were relatively common when there was high development times, when there's um, stagnant development, they tended to drop them because it was an added cost to the developer and they want, people wanted building going on in the community. So it, it's, and it's not a, a massive amount of money. Um, so that may not apply in all situations. 
So then um, the next piece is, is really the capital campaign, which is, is a big part of your fundraising. You're looking for major donors and you're also looking for grants. So there is one um, grant program that if you're out, your municipality is eligible for, you can get um, some significant money um, through. So it's a community development block grant for public facilities. The one caveat is that a municipality can only use it once a year and it's a competitive process. So if their priority is building streets, they're gonna use that money. If they're gonna write a grant application to fund streets or fund a sewer treatment plant or a, waste, or, or, or a water facility, they may not wanna fund the library with that dollars. So you, again, that's going back to getting the municipality to buy into this project. You, you want their support so that they'll write this grant. And, and five years ago, that grant was a match grant of dollar for dollar match up to um, a half a million dollars. So it's a significant amount of money. A few years ago, they changed it to a million dollars with a 50% match. So if you had $500,000, you'd get a million dollar grant potentially from that project. So it is a significant amount of money there. So you want to really look at it and say, okay, can we get into that cycle? It only happens once a year. So you, you've got to be prepared for that. Typically a uh, engineering firm or a skilled grant writer in these types of um, projects will write the proposal. It's typically a 50 to 100 page proposal. They're looking at site assessments, um, facility assessments, and expressing community need. It gets back to that shared use building. So if you were to have a community center and a library in there, you'll get better points for that versus just a standalone library. So kind of thinking of, about that from, from a, a political standpoint. So then the other um, pieces are donations, um, friends of the library, you know, different fundraising events. Um, if, yeah, if you, if you're lucky, you get a, 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 a nice donor bequest um, and your, your project's on the way. So when we, when we look at um, the capital campaign, again, you're gonna want some representation from the library board and, and or the building committee. Um, you're going to want potential donors on that committee. You're going to want an individual to be the head of the capital campaign that has significant influence in the community and often significant dollars to support the project. Um, you know, 20,000, 100,000, however big the project is, you kind of want to be able to match that donor with what their initial gift is going to be. You have to have people on there that are willing to ask for donations in person. This is, capital campaigns are not done by email. They're not done by Facebook posts. They're done by one-on-one -on -one contacts. Um, you need to put together a case statement, basically selling why you need a new library and what it's gonna do for the community. You need to create a list of potential donors for your project. Who, who would be the people that we need to talk to? Who are the influential people? Who are the people with money that live in your community currently or made it big and left your community? Um, so, you know, one, one avenue for those donors are um, high school alumni groups. So if you have a group of people that um, are well-organized and they have all those uh, email list for everybody that's um, an alumni and they invite them to a class reunion, see if you can tap into that. Um, if a hospital or other group has done a, a capital campaign, kind of see who are some of the folks that donated to that campaign. Just because they donated it to one doesn't mean they're going to donate to the library. Um, and in some cases, people may not donate to the hospital, but they may donate to the library. So just because they didn't give before, don't exclude them. And just because they gave before, don't expect that they're going to match what they gave to a, a different group. Um, those, those fund drive chairs, those are those prominent people with money or 
prestige that you want to have part part of that group. You want to establish target amounts. So let's say you have a million dollar campaign. Um, you want to try to find one or two donors that get you a third to a half of that project cost. Um, and then build that chart down so that, you know, you may get a hundred people that give a thousand dollars and then you get um, five people to give $5,000. You kind of want to give yourself some targets to, to make sure that you're hitting what you need. Um, that's kind of based on um, categories. So you can do donor levels. So there's like the, let's say you wanted to pick a theme. So let's say you were in a area where there's, you know, a bird sanctuary nearby or a, a wetland marsh. Maybe you want to have the, the Sand Hill Crane is the top donor, the um, pheasant is the next one or whatever. So you've got some categories that make sense. Some of them will do nature-based, some will do authors, um, literary figures, all kinds of different ways of, of adding some fun to the, to the categories um, that you have. Um, so the next few slides are kind of some ideas of of what project funding might look like. Um, this happens to be for Oregon. Um, they're in the um, midst of a capital campaign. Um, there's different ways to give. So, you know, a one-time donation, pledges over a period of time. Unfortunately, with pledges, if they do it over three years, your project, and if your project's gonna start within a year, pledge year two and three, you tend, to to have to bridge those dollars somehow. So that's where a loan might be beneficial. But if you're, if you're three years out in this campaign, a pledge works fine. Um, if you wanna deal with stocks or tangible items for donations, you can do that. It gets a little messier. Um, again, it's what, what is the capacity of, of the library and the capital campaign to, to manage those kinds of things? Um, some cases, um, you may want to work with a community foundation, which deals with that stuff all the time and, and have them be your organization to manage those donations. Um, that's something you, you kind of have to look at on a case by case basis. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of the naming categories. So if you want to sell naming rights, um, which again is a local library board decision. Um, if you want to name the library after somebody, have a policy in place, um, which allows the library board to accept or, or reject a, a specific name. Um, you, you, you don't want to just say, yeah, well, you can name the building for $6 million. Well, you know, I want to name the, the building after um, I don't know, I, some individual that's not well, res, well respected anymore. Um, you go back to like when Penn State um, had the controversy with their uh, football coach, a bunch of buildings were named after him. They, they stripped, all, stripped his name off the building. So you, you want to be careful of um, those naming rights. Um, then you can go all the way down to um, the spaces that you want to name. Um, there, you know, there, there's a couple on here for the, the restroom. So they're gonna put a donor plaque next to a restroom. Obviously it's a high traffic area, um, great for a business that wants to promote themselves. Um, I've also seen libraries where they'll name individual shelving ranges for an individual. Um, and there's plaques everywhere. So again, aesthetically, how, how do you want this to look? Um, you, that, that's something to be conscious of um, image wise. Um, but there are a, a host of opportunities to do that. You wanna make them large enough so that you can pay for the construction and furnishings of those spaces. Um, but also affordable enough for within your community. So, you know, if, if you're a, 
you don't want to say naming the library for four million dollars when the entire project's only three million dollars um, and then divvy up all the other rooms um, for that remaining million you kind of want to make sure it's affordable for your community um, Colby did a, a significant job of raising um, money for their project. Um, they put together the case statement, which is, was a, a booklet. So the, the slide here has a cover of the booklet. And then um, that, that booklet's still up um, now. That's a trick with websites. Sometimes they disappear. Um, so you have to if you find something you want, pop it into a folder somewhere so that you have it for down the road just in case it disappears. Um, they did a great job of giving a history of the library, what they need, um, and why you should give to the project. Um, and you know, it's a 10,000 square foot building, so it's it's a pretty amazing for a community of I think 2,000. Um, the again, this is um, what. Um, Somerset did for their project. So this is kind of their um, second phase of their fundraising. Um, they, they have that bridge loan um, that they need to pay off. So you'll notice um, under campaign information, there's the case statement. There's a mini case statement. So that's the condensed version of it. Um, the campaign um, study. So they hired an outside um, consultant to say, yes, the community has the capacity to raise money or no it doesn't have capacity um so that's one thing to look at so the interesting thing about the campaign assessment is it depending on your community and who you talk to you may get a different vision of whether your community is ready or not to do fundraising so somerset is located three miles away from New Richmond. New Richmond's been looking at a building project for 20 years. They did a fundraising consultant study and they said, well, you're gonna be lucky um, if you can raise $2 million. And um, New Richmond's a community of almost 10,000 people now. Uh, there's Walmart, Culver's, um, several other chains, two quick trip gas stations, um, airport, hospital, whole nine yards. That's what they found out from the people they talked to. Somerset, um, literally, like I said, three miles down the road, community of 2,000, 3,000 people um, raised $2 million. So either the assessment for New Richmond was wrong or people don't support the library in New Richmond or people don't like the city of New Richmond in terms of municipal government. They bought it into the library project in Somerset. Some of the donor um, would have crossover because they're so close to each other. So again, it's, a, it's an important piece, but again, if you know your community well enough, you may, may or may not need that. And then the library also had space needs report done and um, that was posted as well as a building program statement. So that all that information is there for people that they wanna go take a look at it and understand the project. Is there any other questions, Shauna, before I jump to the next one? There's a fo um, person that asked, the fundraising work and the design build work seem so chicken and egg. Any words of wisdom for someone just starting this journey? Yeah, so yeah, there is the chicken and egg. Um, so really what you wanna do is have a concept drawing in place so that you can start your building program. So you're really gonna have to hire an architect um, first to get, a kind of a rough layout of what the inside is going to look like and rough layout. I mean, just boxes um, and then a um, idea of what your exterior is going to look like based on your site. Um, and then you can go off and do the fundraising because they'll, they'll also have a cost estimate there for you. Um, so again, when you're looking at your project and selling your project, you want to be able to promote it. You know, obviously website, Facebook, 
um, looking at social media. Um, you want to look at photos of how your library is being used now. So if you're really looking at programming space, you want to make sure you're capturing moving forward um, that group of 50 people that were to program that were packing the library or the fact you had 100 people out in the grass um, next to the library. You want all of that for your information and, and your support. So you want to be able to share those kinds of things. Um, Again, it, it, it kind of gathers all that information um, moving forward. Um, then um, you kind of want to make sure you, when you're doing the campaign to make sure the community is aware of what's going on. There's going to be a part of that campaign that you're going to want to raise, you know, a third to a half of your project what they call a quiet phase where you're not really telling people you want to make a splash to get to that last half. Um, and you want to look at, okay, we've already raised half our goal. We need your help. Um, we're going to do some more community contacts, but we've already made the contacts for the bigger donors. Um, you want to kind of uh, make sure that you're continuing to update local officials um, the news media, sharing out pictures, all of the different things. So, you know, you want to recognize that don't that hundred thousand dollar donation. So you want a, a, a big check um, and, you know, a, a bunch of press, um, however that looks. And press in many of our communities now is ourselves promoting the library on a friend's page or something like that. We don't have local newspapers that jump up and down for local news anymore. Um, so again, this is an example of what Eau Claire did for their project. Yes, much larger project, but it uh, is all scalable. Um, Baraboo for their project actually did little uh, video snippets for um, promoting why we need a library. Um, they picked prominent people in the community and they also picked kids so that you could get both levels of um, support. You know, you're, you know, you playing on the cuteness factor a little bit, but also then the informed citizen folks. Um, and then the other piece is looking at, um, you, you know, kind of doing those updates and, and how you want to um, put them out. So again, visual, you know, the pie chart gives you a really good idea of, of moving that forward. Um, and again, here's some, some additional examples of it, some more videos and some more updates. Um, you know, now, now we're kind of in that, you know, we need to figure out our architect and this step may start way back when, or it can be kind of before the building campaign starts. It, it, it really depends on your comfort level. Um, architects are not, you're not required to bid out. So you don't have to get lowest bid for an architect because they're a service provider. Um, you want a firm that has library experience. Um, but you also want the individual doing the project. So the project architect to have experience with library buildings. So a firm may have done 20 library projects or maybe have done five library projects, but the architect that did those projects left and went to another firm. So you're hiring the project architect, you're not hiring the firm. So you wanna make sure when you're looking at that process that you're hiring somebody with that's doing the project with experience because you don't want to be the first library project um, that they've ever designed. Um, so you're, you're kind of looking at that. Um, there are um, different engineering firms out there that have architectural design work. So some municipalities will already have a relationship with um, MSA or AIRS or uh, Cedar Corporation or um, SEH. Those are some of the more prominent um, engineering firms that have architectural work. The, they do have some library experience. Again, you want to look at that. Um, they're probably um, going to be more of a, a, a function over form project. Um, other architectural firms um, will specialize in library projects um, as one of their main areas of focus. And so they'll be a little bit more creative um, 
and and they're just typically as affordable as, as some of those other firms as well. Um, we're in a unique situation in Wisconsin. We obviously have the Milwaukee group of architects. We have a Madison group of architects. We have the Twin Cities, um, Minnesota architectural firms. We also have some over in the Fox Valley area. Um, but then there's a smattering of other firms within Wisconsin or in Iowa, Minnesota that have done library projects. So we're in a good spot um, for finding a good firm. Um, there's a process called uh, QBS or qualification based selection. If you're going to potentially um, have a federal grant, you'll want to use this process because you're really looking at qualifications um, and not just gut feelings on who you want to hire. Um, um, South Central Library System maintains a list of architectural firms that have done building projects in Wisconsin or near Wisconsin. So it's a great place to start to at least, again, look at what the projects that they've done virtually, um, get a list of places that you may want to go visit, and then also a list of firms you may want to request proposals from for qualifications. Um, again, now we're at that um, concept phase you know, whether we're looking at new building, an addition renovation, or a conversion of an existing building, um, it, the sketches will be based on one of those. Um, you'll you'll want, also want to, you know, kind of do a site layout. So this is what it's going to look like on the on the, the property. Um, this is what the exterior is going to look like moving forward. Um, and then they'll also um, probably do some preliminary work on um, utilities and environmental issues. Just do a quick site history, make sure that site works. Um, and then they'll also give you a rough idea of what the cost is going to be. Today, it's bounces 10, 20% based on material cost, um, but it's going to give you a rough idea. Um, and that's what you can kind of use. They'll, they'll put escalator clauses in there so that if, you know, it's going to be a couple of uh, years out, they'll build in some inflation into that. So there are some examples of sketches. This is Oregon's building. Obviously, it's a pretty good sized building, but the concept is still the same. They'll give you something that looks like this, something that will look like this for the interior with labels to give you an idea of where things are going to be at. Um, th these are the kinds of things that you need to move forward with fundraising. You'll also use these to introduce the project to the community. Some architects will work just with staff and say, okay, this is the design we're going with, while others will maybe present three different designs to the community where they'll say, yeah, I like this piece, I don't like this piece, and then they'll remesh a new concept. So there's a couple of ways that they can use that. Um, so kind of these are the foundational pieces for this project. You want to maintain solid communication, have an effective project team. Um, you need people with passion for the project because it's going to get rough sometimes. It's, this is not a cakewalk. Um, in many cases, this is like having a second job. So you've got your library director job and the library building project. Both are very time consuming. Um, so you, you'll need to balance it out and, and, and really be dedicated to that. And you'll need to be flexible. You know, if budget doesn't allow it, um, something to happen. The site doesn't allow something to happen. You need to be flexible. But you, again, you want to make sure what the end result is really focuses on what your long-term goals were for th that project way back when, when you started dreaming this all up. So that's the end of kind of the, the stuff to, to get to a nutshell. And this is pre-construction. Um, if you work on, when you get to the point where you start reviewing construction drawings and all that kind of stuff that, and furnishing the building, that's a whole nother set of uh, conversations. Um, but it'll uh, give you a start to, to um, go down your journey. And um, yeah, if you have any questions now, great. If you think of something afterwards and you want to just shoot me an email, please go ahead and do that. Um, I'll be happy to answer those questions. And, um, you know, if some point you want to do this in person and have it expanded out, um, I'm certainly happy to do that as well. Thank you, John. We do have one question. If you could share any price range, do you, do you have that available for what an architect's, uh, an architect's preliminary work 
typically costs? I, it depends on the scope of that work. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, the last couple of projects, it was probably in the $20,000 range, but don't quote me on that for sure. Um, but it, it's somewhere in that range. Um, but it, you know, it depends if you want more or less out of that project. If you want multiple examples of layouts, you're gonna add more. If you want 3D imaging, it's gonna cost you more. Well, it is 11.30, so we better get going. But thank you, John, for the like, amazing overview. That was a lot of information. <laughs> thank you for being here today. Um, everyone, you will get an email from me with a link to a short evaluation of today's program. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everyone.